Welcome to the Substance Abuse Group Orientation for Georgia Reentry Center. My name is Desiree Cochran Norfolk. Just a little bit about who we are and uh, what this group is all about is what this orientation is for to give you some understanding of what the goals are and what the rules are of treatment and how to proceed forward. So again, my name is Desiree Cochran Norfolk. I am an addiction counselor. I have a master's in addiction counseling through Liberty University and my undergrad is in criminal justice and public policy uh, through Georgia State University. I have been a counselor since 2017 and I hold a uh, certification through the Georgia Addiction Counselors Association. Um, I am certified as a certified clinical supervisor, certified master addiction counselor, uh, certified addiction counselor level two. I'm also certified by the Florida Board of uh, Certification Board as an MCAP, uh, master certified addi addiction professional, and I am a certified anger management specialist and um, many other roles that I play. Um, I do family violence, uh, parenting, life skills, things of that nature. So my role here is just to orient you to services, um, explain how the program works, explain the rules and expectations, uh, help you understand the process of enrollment and treatment and completion and understand some of the basics of substance abuse and treatment and give you a foundation before you start your groups. So just so you can understand, addiction is a chronic relapsing disorder that's characterized by compulsive drug seeking and use despite any adverse consequences. It's a medical illness that's caused by repeated misuse of a substance or substances. Substance abuse is a pattern of compulsive substance use. So the negative consequences of drug abuse affect not only individuals who abuse drugs, but also their family and friends, various businesses, government resources, things like that. And although many of these effects can't be quantified, societal costs of tobacco, alcohol, and illicit drug use are nearly 6% of the nation's income. That's over $532 billion a year. And the most obvious effects of drug abuse, which are manifested in individuals who abuse drugs, include ill health, sickness, and ultimately death. Particularly devastating to an abuser's health is the, con uh, the contraction of needleborne illnesses like hepatitis and HIV and AIDS through injection drug use. So the NSDUH data indicated that in 2004, there were over 3,694,500 individuals who were 18 and older who were admitted uh, to having injected an illicit drug during their lifetime. And the Center for Disease Control and Prevention reports about 1.2 million adults live with HIV in the United States. Of the estimated 15.9 million people who inject drugs worldwide, up to 3 million of them are affected with HIV. And the survival rate for those persons is less than uh, that for the persons who contract AIDS from any other mode of transmission. And children and individuals who abuse drugs are often abused and neglected as a result of the individual's preoccupation with the drugs. National level studies have actually shown that parents who abuse drugs often put their need to obtain and abuse drugs before the health and welfare of their children. 5% of pregnant women aged 15 to 44% having uh, reported having used illicit drugs in the past month. Um, and that same data showed that 8.5% of new mothers reported having used illicit drugs in the past month. So children whose parents and other family members abuse drugs are often physically and emotionally abused, and they often lack proper immunizations, medical care, dental care, and necessities like food, water, and shelter. So the risk to children is even greater when their parents or guardians manufacture illicit drugs like methamphetamines. So methamphetamine abusers often produce the drug in their own homes and apartments using hazardous chemicals like um, certain acids and iodines and ammonia. 
And so children who inhabit these homes often inhale the dangerous chemical fumes and the gases, or they may ingest toxic chemicals or illicit drugs. And so these children commonly test positive for methamphetamine and they suffer from both short and long-term health consequences. And because a lot of the methamphetamine producers also abuse the drugs, children commonly suffer from neglect that leads to uh, psychological and developmental problems along the way. So NCLSS data showed that the U.S. law enforcement agencies reported having seized 9,895 illicit methamphetamine laboratories in 2004. And these agencies reported that um, almost 2,500 children were affected by these laboratories because they were exposed to the chemicals, they, they lived at the laboratory sites, or they were just displaced from their homes, while 12 children were injured and three children were killed in that study. Um, the economic impact of drug abuse on businesses whose employees abuse drugs can actually be really significant. While a lot of the drug users un are unable to attain or hold full-time employment, those who do work put others at risk, particularly when they're employed in positions where even a minor degree of impairment could be catastrophic, like airline pi pilots, air traffic controllers, train operators, bus drivers, and that's just to name a few examples. So Quest Diagnostics, which is a national firm that conducts employee drug tests for employers, reports that the post-accident positivity rate was 7.3% in 2022, and that's up from 6.7% in 2021. Economically, these businesses are affected because the employees who abuse drugs sometimes steal cash or supplies, equipments, and products that can be sold to get money to buy the drugs. And absenteeism and lost productivity and an increased use of medical and insurance benefits by employees who abuse drugs are going to affect the business financially. Economic consequences of drug abuse severely burdens federal, state, and local government resources, and ultimately the taxpayer. This effect is most evident with methamphetamines. These clandestine uh, methamphetamine laboratories jeopardize the safety of citizens, and they adversely affect the environment. And children and law enforcement personnel, emergency responders, and those who live at or near methamphetamine production sites have been seriously injured or killed as a result of the production. And methamphetamine users often require extensive medical treatment. Uh, some abuse, abuse or neglect or abandon their children. And that adds to the social services costs. And some also commit a host of other crimes, including domestic violence, assault, burglary, identity theft. And so these producers tax already strained law enforcement resources and budgets as a result of the staggering costs that are associated with the remediation of these laboratory sites. And so according to the DEA, the average cost to clean up a methamphetamine production laboratory is $1,900. And given that an average of 9,777 meth lab seizures were reported between 2002 and 2004, that impact is pretty obvious, 2,000 times almost 10,000. So the DEA absorbs a significant portion of these costs through a hazardous waste cleanup program. And in 2004, they administered over 10,000 state and local clandestine laboratory cleanups and dump sites, and it cost them over $18.6 million. Nonetheless, the resources of the state and the local agencies are also significantly affected. So, for example, 69% of the county officials responding to a 2005 survey by the National Association of Counties reported that they had to develop additional training and special protocols for county health care uh, welfare workers who work with children who are exposed to methamphetamine. And the time and the manpower that's involved in investigating and cleaning up these labs increases the workload of an already overburdened law enforcement system. And here, I just kind of want to show you the magnitude of the impact that the substance use is having. 20.4 million people in the U.S. were diagnosed with an SUD in the last year. That's a substance use disorder. And only 10.3% of those people uh, with a substance use disorder in the past year actually received treatment. 
So only 10% of those 20 million people actually got any help. And nearly 71,000 people died of a drug overdose in 2019. And you can see that somewhere around 2014, 2015, 2013, somewhere in this area, we see this huge spike in fentanyl overdoses. And we can see that just it's dramatically increasing in the drug overdose deaths. I want to talk to you a little bit about how addiction can develop. Not everybody who enters treatment is an addict. Um, they can be in various cycles or various stages of the cycle. Um, so when we first start out, we are in what we call abstinence, where we haven't used anything ever. So this is like from birth until the first time you try something. Then we move into what we would call experimentation experimentation is you can stay there for quite some time um, so for example with marijuana you could try it in a blunt you could try it in a joint you could try it in a bowl you could try it in a bong you could try indicas you can try sativas you can try varying amounts um, so you can try many different routes of administration different types different amounts and still be in the experimentation phase then after you figure out what it's going to do to you, then you move into the social use phase. This is where you're going to be using it with other people. So you want to use it with him. You want to use it with her. You want to use it with Bob. You want to use it with Joe. You want to use it with Bob and Joe. It's just a way to um, increase your social life and, and you use it as a um, kind of like a social lubricant. That's what they call alcohol. After a while, this becomes very second nature to you, and um, you start to, to do this in your free time. It, you do it at home at the end of a long day, whether you're you know smoking weed or you're drinking or something. Um, and so it starts to become what we call the habitual phase. It's, it's becoming a habit. Um, instead of every once in a while, now you're coming home every day and having a beard to relax and unwind while you watch TV. After a while, that one beer turns into two because one isn't going to be enough for you. And then that two turns into a tall boy. And that tall boy turns into two tall boys. And just so you know, a standard drink is 12 ounces of alcohol. Um, so, well, beer and 1.5 ounces of liquor. So let's say you're drinking one small 12 ounce can and then you move into a tall boy, which is either 16 or 24 ounces. So let's say it's the 24 ounce can. So you come home, you have a 24 ounce can every day. That's actually two beers. And then you move to two cans. That's actually four beers every day. And then, you know, if you have three, then that's six. And so now you've drank a whole six pack just in three cans sitting there in one night. And it is no longer a habit for you. You've moved into what we call the abuse stage. Abuse can very, very quickly lead to what we would call substance use dependence, um, or as most people like to term it, addiction. Um, and this is where we have a tissue dependence, our bodies need it to function normally, and if we don't have it, we start to go into withdrawals. So all of the curriculum that we discuss in our groups is based on Prochaska and DiClemente stages of change model. So in this model, we have pre-contemplation, which is the denial stage. Um, I don't have a problem. You're the one with the issue. And if you have an issue, you need to take it up with Jesus because I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing. So this person doesn't think that they have an issue and they see everybody else as being the problem. Then something happens and then you move into the contemplation stage. And we call this the well, maybe stage. Maybe I do, maybe I don't, don't really care. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. Um, you're on the fence and very ambivalent about it. Ambivalence means on the fence. Then something happens and you move into the preparation stage. And this is one of the most important stages. Uh, this is where we make a plan. We identify what our triggers are, um, what we're going to do if we are triggered, what are some of the obstacles that could hold us back, who is going to be our support system in this, um, and making this change. And by the way, this can be applied to any behavior change, not just substance use. 
So the preparation stage is you haven't actually made a change yet, but you realize that you do have to make a change. And so you're going to come up with a very solid plan in order to do that. And then once you have your plan, then you can move into the action stage, which is what I like to call the Nike stage, because this is where we just do it. You know, you've thrown away the cigarettes. You started getting up on time in the morning, whatever your behavior changes. And you still may have tendencies to want to go back to your old behavior, but you're working your plan, you're relying heavily on your plan that you made in the preparation stage, and you're continuing forward. Then after, you know, some time has passed, it starts to become second nature to you. This, it turns into, this is just who you are and what you do now. You don't do that old behavior anymore. So I quit smoking cigarettes. I quit drinking. I don't do that anymore. I'm not even bothered by it at this point. And that's when we would be moving into the maintenance stage. This is where we've internalized the change. And so Prochaska and DiClemente, they say that the relapse stage is part of this process. We know that people will relapse and go back to an old behavior. And so it kind of just depends on where they go back from. Either they're in maintenance or action and they go back to preparation or they'll go back to contemplation or either pre-contemplation. So it is part of this process and they make this concession because we know that people are, are going to make mistakes sometimes. And there's also an exit arrow because the more change attempts that we make, the better we're going to be able to make that change in the future. Because now I've learned that whatever happened that made me go back to drinking or using drugs or that old behavior, I can look at it and say, okay, I know what happened here. I know what part of my plan didn't work. And so I can fix my plan, go back to the preparation stage, make sure I put that down as, okay, this triggered me to use, and now I can make a plan to avoid that or alter how I behave when I'm I'm faced with that trigger. So there is various levels of treatment that a clinician can give to you after an evaluation. So the very first level of treatment um, is the psychoeducation, which is an ASAM level 0.5. This is like your DUI school. Um, It's very low level, not really counseling. It's just what we would call education. And then above that is ASAM level one. And so we would say this is early intervention or relapse prevention. So either you made a mistake and you're you're not quite there at addiction, um, but you've been dabbling with substances and you made a mistake, and so now you need more information so you don't go down that road to addiction, or you did have an addiction and you stopped using, and so now you wanna maintain your recovery, and so you will go to what we call relapse prevention, and they're typically the same groups. Then above and beyond that, ASAM level two is intensive outpatient treatment. This is where you typically go three to five days a week and you'll have some sort of um, AA or NA or 12 step program that you attend in the evening time, but you still get to go home at night. And so with outpatient treatment, that can be up to nine hours a week worth of treatment. Intensive outpatient usually falls in between nine, nine to 19 hours a week. Then we have inpatient residential, which is ASAM level three, and there's varying levels of ASAM level three, like a 3.1, 3.5, but mostly this is just, you're in the facility, you may get weekend or evening passes to go out and go shopping, or uh, maybe go visit family members or something every once in a while after you've established uh, your recovery time, but you're living in the facility and you don't go home at night. And then we have ASAM level four, which is what I lovingly call detox. This is a very short-lived program, but it's inpatient with medication assistance. So whoever did your evaluation, they stated that you need to be in an ASAM level one or two group. Um, And so maybe now this gives you a little bit more clarity as to why they put you in the uh, level of care that they did. The road to recovery for people struggling with addiction can be really challenging. 
And having a support system along with other treatments and therapy is going to be really important for ongoing success and fighting against relapse. And there may be different benefits to having a support system, including a sense of belonging and connection. It's not uncommon for people recovering from addiction to feel really lonely and feel isolated. So having a support system can provide company and incorporate people in your life that might relate to what you're going through. Your support system doesn't have to be made up of just family or friends. Support groups are a really great great way to start building connection with people in an environment that's free from judgment. It's also going to give some practical assistance. During the early stage of recovery, it's common to need assistance with regular life tasks. Um, a support system can really assist with things like transportation, grocery shopping, and other errands. And that could potentially alleviate some stress for people in recovery and give them the opportunity to focus solely on their new lifestyle. It's going to provide you with accountability and motivation. During these times of temptation and potential relapse, a support system can provide accountability and motivation. And it's, either, uh, it's going to be easier to fall into unhealthy patterns when people isolate themselves. So having that support system around you during recovery is healthy and it's a positive element for your success. And it's a support, a sounding board. Um, it, you get camaraderie and different perspectives and accountability and confidence and self-discovery and you learn to make transitions. And so group therapy also offers the benefits of the group setting, including the ability to talk to other people and avoid being the center of attention. But it has less of a personal focus than, in, than individual therapy. And then we have you know, privacy and scheduling disadvantages and things like that. But support groups can provide an opportunity for people to share experiences and feelings and coping strategies and firsthand information. And studies have actually shown that people in support groups are less likely to be re-hospitalized and spend time in inpatient care facilities. And we know that peer support can really help people self-advocate and connect to resources and work and set goals. And there's so many more benefits. Let's talk a little bit about the stigma and shame. Stigma is associated with substance use disorders, and it can take many different forms, including discriminatory attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. And stigma can be rooted in the belief that Addiction is a personal choice or a lack of willpower or a moral failing. I've heard many people say, oh, I, you know, I, I'm not weak. <laughs> Stigma is harmful for people with substance use disorders because it can cause them to have a reluctance to seek help or treatment or maybe lack understanding by family and friends and coworkers or other people in the community and it causes fewer opportunities for work or school or social activities and trouble finding housing. Stigma is one of the biggest barriers for people seeking and receiving treatment for substance use disorders. And so this stigma that's associated with behaviors that increase the risk of developing substance use disorders. And in this, these groups, we take the position that seeking help is a sign of strength. Many, many years ago, we were under what we call the moral model of addiction, where people believed that it was a willpower problem or that you just weren't a good person if you were using drugs and alcohol and you just need to go to church and be make better decisions and you'll be good. Unfortunately, that's not the case. It's not a moral issue. We now know that substance abuse has caused changes, chemical and physical changes in the way that the neurons connect in the brain and the chemical pathways that are in the brain. And so now we know that it is what we call a disease and it's a lifestyle disease. It's kind of like when you get diabetes. Diabetes type two is a lifestyle disease. It comes from lack of exercise and poor eating habits over your life. And much like addiction, it's what we've done in our lives that lead to the changes that have been made in our body physically. And so now we have, we can't get rid of it. We can't get rid of diabetes. We can manage it though. And it's the same with substance abuse. We can't get rid of substance uh, addiction, but we can manage it. 
So the goals of our substance abuse group are helping people cope with their substance abuse and other problems, providing support and a safe environment to talk about trauma, developing healthy coping skills, motivating people to enter the recovery ready stage, continuing treatment for any co-occurring mental health issues that encourage substance use, and helping people overcome withdrawal symptoms and work through their cravings. We are here to help you with your recovery, the education, and provide mutual support in a group setting. And we keep this, environmental confident, this environment confidential and safe. And as counselors, we uphold your confidentiality, but there are some exceptions to that. We are mandated reporters, and this means that we're required by law to report any instances of suspected child abuse or elder abuse, or if somebody's having homicidal or suicidal ideations. Or lastly, if you signed a release of information that gives myself or the administrative staff permission to report things to someone else, like your probation officer, your employer, your caseworker, your spouse, your mama, whoever. And we do ask that what is said in group stays in group, don't go back and tell your mama, your brother, your sister, your cousins, your friends what was said in this group. You are expected to keep the identities of everyone in here and their stories to yourself forevermore. And if you happen to see me in the community, I'm not going to address you. I'm not doing it to be mean or rude. I do that to protect your confidentiality. Because if I wave and say hello and you happen to be with somebody, they're bound to ask, well, who's that? And then you would have to explain, well, that's my addiction counselor. And that would reveal your status as a client. I'll be more than happy to say hello if you address me first, though. And as I am in the role of your counselor, there are a few limits to how we may interact outside of this group setting. We are not allowed to have dual relationships with clients. This means that I cannot accept gifts from you and I cannot give gifts to you. I can't let you borrow money. I can't let you I can't borrow money from you. I can't hire you to clean my house or fix my car or cut my trees down and I can't accept any friend requests from you on social media. I'm not gonna look you up on social media and I expect the same courtesy in return. And if we have an issue arise, please address it with me personally. And if we can't resolve the issue, then we can discuss what next steps need to happen. This program is set up to be once a week for ACM level one, depending on your assessment recommendations. Um, or multiple times a week for ASAM level two. Each group is to last about three hours. Being on time is important. Late entry is not going to be permitted and it will be counted as an absence. If you are more than 10 minutes late and you, you do come into the group late and you stay, it will not be counted as an absence, but it's not going to count towards your required groups. So we call this auditing. You can sit in and you can listen so that you get the content, but it won't count towards your uh, required group numbers uh, if you are more than 10 minutes late. And if you leave the group because you are late, then, um, or if you leave early, then it will be counted as an absence. If you miss three groups in a row, you have three absences in a row, you will be at risk of termination from the program and you may have to start the process all over again. You will only be permitted five total absences for the program. At that point, you will be risk, at risk of termination from the program, and you may have to start the groups over again or have an, another assessment. So let's talk a little bit about the format here. I am here to help you learn about yourself and decide whether there's any changes that you would like to make. I have the knowledge and the skills to help you, but if there's any changing to be done, you have to be the one to do it. The responsibility for change is up to you. I'm not gonna coerce you or try to force you to change in any way. I am the facilitator, but you also play an important role in helping other people in the group as you're all going through this process together. In this group, we avoid confrontation and we help each other by being supportive and respectful. And we understand that we've each walked our own path, so we don't try to be the expert about another person's life or choices. In our groups, we do discuss different topics related to substance use or abuse. And you're given an opportunity to explore and discuss your own behaviors and thoughts and beliefs. And as a group member, you're going to be expected to contribute to the discussion. You're going to be expected to take what you're learning in these groups and apply it to your everyday life. And you're also expected to do the homework. And I always say, if you're in group and you're giving surface level answers, then that's what you get back from this group is surface level stuff. 
you're you're not going to take anything substantial away from this group if you give surface level answers. So dig deep and do the work in group. So there is a need for some basic group rules to help keep the group cohesive. And, you know, I found that these group rules here are helpful in establishing a safe environment where clients feel free to participate. So these are the rules. Respect yourself and others in the group. Refrain from interrupting or talking while other people are talking. Refrain from using electronic devices during in-person groups. Avoid put downs of all self uh, of yourself or all others or name calling. Uh, be willing to listen without becoming aggressive or defensive. Maintain confidentiality outside of the group. Maintain abstinence of all substances. Do not attend any sessions if you have used any intoxicating or mood altering illegal substances. And if you are on medication, please inform the facilitator of the group before group starts. Be on time and stay the entire group. No violent behavior or language. Group participation is a must. And if there's any additional rules that you'd like to add, please let us know. And just understand that violation of any of these rules may res result in removal from the group. So here are a couple of resources for you. Um, if you need any resources whatsoever, um, 211 is the United Way. Um, you can call 211 on your phone or Google the 211 website and you can get any resources that are in the community. They have all of that information from housing to job skills development classes to um, employment services, addiction services, mental health services, everything you need down to a toothbrush. They also have a 24 hour, uh, seven day a week hotline that um, has mental health licensed mental health clinicians that you can speak to if you are feeling homicidal or suicidal. 988 is also a suicide helpline, 1-800-SUICIDE, 1-800-662-HELP um, is another one, or if the teen text line is 55753 if you want to text um, and you are a teenager and you're having mental health emergencies, um, you can or ideations, you can talk to them. And of course, and always 911 if there is an emergency. There are some websites out here. If you are looking for any meetings for 12 step groups, you can go to alcoholicsanonymous.org, narcoticsanonymous.org. Um, there's other places where you can find addiction recovery related resources, which is the national rehab hotline.org, samsa.gov, nida.nih.gov. And then, of course, I put my website up here, which is GeorgiaReentryCenters.com. On this website, we have various resources in the community. On our resources page, we also have a forum where you can talk with the other group members outside of group to kind of share um, if you're having cravings or to network with other people, uh, share your business, share recovery uh, friendly related places or uh, events. Um, or even um, felon friendly uh, employment opportunities or things like that. Um, so that's what that forum is for. And there's also other courses up there on the website under the courses tab where you can take uh, courses such as um, productivity, self-discipline, developing confidence and charisma, anger, uh, keeping your anger in check, communication, things like that. There's some other books and articles and apps that may be helpful to you. There's two books. One is called Unbroken Brain and the other is Rewired. Great reads. Um, and there's some uh, recovery related apps that you can download. One is I Am Sober, another is We Connect, and another is Sober Grid. And this is just to help enhance the treatment. So just the next steps here. You want to make sure that you join the meeting uh, about five minutes ahead of time if you're on Zoom. You want to get there about 10 minutes ahead of time if we're in person. And be sure to click on the link in the chat box to sign in if you're on the Zoom meeting. If you can't pay, you can still come to group that week um, and you can carry a balance for two weeks. But you can't have any more than two weeks or two group fees in arrears. So that would be no more than $80 balance or um, longer than carrying that balance for two weeks. 
Um, if you do have a balance of more than two weeks or two group fees, you can continue to come to groups, but they're not going to be counted towards your required groups. We call that auditing. And so they're not going to count toward the required groups, but you can still come and, and get the material that we're presenting in group that week. You should have received an email with the required documents. Please be sure to click on each link and fill out all of the required fields in each one of those forms. Make sure to hit submit when you've completed the form. Please use the document submission link to submit any additional documents like court orders, evaluations, TPOs, bond requirements, or bond modifications, TPO modifications, etc. Basically anything that we, we have requested from you or if you think that we may need it. If you had an evaluation through another source, we're required to have that evaluation. So you can either submit it through that document portal or you can fill out the consent of release of information for us to release information to that evaluator so that we can request the evaluation from them. Um, so we also need you to fill out the consent form for all parties that you wish us to release information to. So this can include your probation officer, your pretrial officer, your attorney, your employer, your SAP, any other interested parties that you think that we may need to reach out to or speak with. We have to have um, a different form it has to be filled out for each person that we're releasing information to. So you can fill that form out multiple times if necessary. Also, in the email that you received, you're going to see the Zoom schedule for our online groups. The instructions to get in Zoom are also included in the email, so please be sure to make your payment before group each week. So if you have any questions or comments or concerns, please feel free to reach out to us via email, text message, cell phone, uh, which was located in the email that you received from us. Um, and I hope this has answered most of your questions, but if you still have any more questions, please feel free to call or text or email.